we're thankful for your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your very presence. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. At this time, the uh, children and, and young people may be dismissed uh, to your classes. Amen. Somebody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. God is good. In fact, as they're dismissing, I, I've neglected to mention this for a little while. But it's Faith Promise Sunday today. And uh, God is faithful. Brother Lehman always brings us lots of stories. And nice when one happens to you. Uh, this year, my wife and I, during that, I had in my mind, well, this is what we're going to give. And then during that, uh, that very service, while Brother Lehman was here, God impressed something else on my mind. I discussed it with my wife, and we decided, okay, we're going to up our commitment to X number of dollars per month, which was a pretty good jump from what we were giving uh, prior to that time, which, what was that, late February, first week of March, somewhere in there that, that Brother Lehman was here. And uh, we went ahead and made that commitment. And... Uh, and then it was just a few weeks after that, I guess, I had the joy of paying my taxes. Hallelujah. And I always try to get that done early March, if I can, get everything to my accountant. And, uh, and lo and behold, we find, I get a call from our accountant, and my jaw hit the floor. I could not believe the size of a refund that we were getting for, from our, for our federal taxes, and it pays, it was more than enough to pay in the entirety, the entire year's commitment, and then, and then some. Amen. The Lord knows what he's doing, Sister Ann. Amen. And there's plenty more stories uh, like that, I'm sure. If anybody's been blessed by the Lord since you've made your commitment to faith promise, uh, this year, let, let pastor know, let someone on pastoral staff know, uh, we need to have some testimonies about these things because we serve a faithful God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to be turning this morning into the word of the Lord in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter number 9, and I'm going to be reading and talking about the man with a palsy in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 9, uh, a, a palsy is a general term for a, a gradual uh, paralysis brought on by uh, some condition. There are various types of palsies. Uh, this rendition is in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, the same story is recorded with some further detail in Mark chapter 2 as well as Luke chapter 5. So all of these synoptic gospels record this. We'll be reading from the book of Matthew beginning in uh, chapter 9 verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. Verse 1, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. This was not a four-poster uh, king-size bed, by the way. This was more or less like a mat. Uh, otherwise, later on, when, when this man was healed, uh, maybe they would have needed some moving guys to come in and, and lift everything out. A lot of little details that you can look in into these uh, scriptures, some that are, that are amusing if you think about them. Man with sick of a palsy, lying on a bed, verse 2, and Jesus, seeing their faith, the faith of his friends. So he had some, some, some friends, some, some contemporaries uh, that knew him, that saw the, the need of this man and what they saw rightly as a great need that this man had, and they actually carried him uh, to where Jesus was. Jesus was in this house. I don't, I'm not going to get into too much detail of this. He was in the center of this house. Uh, there was an opening in, in the center of this house because they had to uh, uncover part of a roof, uh, we read, uh, in order uh, to get to Jesus. Well, they were about one floor up, and these roofs were, were only about one story up, and this was the same type of roof that, that uh, Rahab uh, had the spies on, the same type of, of ledge rooftop that David looked down and saw Bathsheba. He wasn't on the fourth story of the palace. He was only about a, a story up, uh, which gives you some thoughts regarding both David and Bathsheba regarding that story. Uh, anyway, they get up onto this, this, it's like a square area that you can, you can walk upon, and there's some little banisters and railing, and they had to remove some of this railing. They must have had ropes, something, because there were so many people, they couldn't get into this house otherwise. They went up by stairs to this rooftop. They lowered 
uh, this man down right before Jesus where he was talking and ministering to this throng of people. And, uh, and, and so they went to great lengths, is the point of saying that, his friends did, in order uh, to bring him uh, unto Jesus. Seeing their faith, because of all this, this work that they did, Jesus said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Interesting initial words Jesus spoke to this man. Perhaps his, the man's friends were going, Huh? Need here. Do you see the need? Yes, he did. And behold, verse 3, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth because of these initial words of Jesus. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. What's easier? What's the harder? What's the greater of, of, of these two things? Jesus goes on to say, But that ye, the scribes, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power uh, unto men. Calling our attention again to verse number 2. They brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on, on a bed. And Jesus, with his first words said to the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins uh, be forgiven thee. And you'll see that this message, which the Lord was laying this upon my heart and mind, spirit, a month or more ago, as my wife and I were reading the word, but you'll see that it, it goes well in line with what Brother Poole uh, was preaching last week. Uh, although he was a bit more on a grander scale, Having us be kingdom-minded, this kind of brings it a little bit down to the more individual level. And I'm entitling this message this morning, What You Need Most. What You Need Most. Lord God, I pray for the ministry of the Word today. We thank you, Lord, for your presence uh, that's been in this house uh, already today. We thank you for how we've felt you in this place. I pray, God, that you help me, Lord, just to, just to say... Those things that need to be said, God, I pray your people would receive uh, understanding from these words that come forth across this pulpit today, Lord. And I pray your people would receive revelation even by your spirit, God, Lord, as the, as the word of God goes forth today. Uh, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ today. Would somebody say in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. What you need most. If I was to ask you or, 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 or to sit down myself and just come up with a list of what are my greatest uh, needs as, as a human being, and as I sat down and thought about this, there are four main things that, 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 that came to me, and those would be air or oxygen, uh, water, food, and shelter. And we can try to prioritize our, our most basic human needs. Uh, we can do it logically, and it's natural for us to do so, to decide what is uh, and what are the most important things. Uh, is food more important than shelter? It depends on circumstances. If I'm in uh, Siberia in the dead of winter, it might be a little more important that I have uh, shelter uh, than that I have food. If I'm in uh, the Garden of Eden and it's, uh, what, 72 degrees, whatever it must have been uh, uh, at that time because they didn't even know that they were naked, uh, food might be a little more important to me. So there can be some, so, some uh, consideration on which of these is a greater priority. Is shelter uh, more important than water? And I can come to a conclusion one way or the other way. And I could be wrong. It's important to note in what I prioritize and what I feel is the most pressing need in a situation and in a specific time. But I think uh, regarding these four things, I, I, I would dare say that all of us could agree that, that oxygen and air, Brother Williams, is probably the most uh, Im important need. Because if I stop breathing, I guarantee you right now I'm going to be fighting for air. Uh, if I have a lack of water... I can, I can go on living for perhaps a week's time or a little more than that. If I 
go without having any food to eat, I can go for perhaps uh, 50 days uh, before this body will shut down uh, and, and die. If I do not have shelter, depending on the, the uh, conditions that I'm in, I could, I could live for an indefinite period of time if I still have food and water. But if I'm without air to breathe, to breathe in oxygen, to, to get oxygen supplied uh, to all of my muscles and tissues uh, of my body. It's a matter of minutes before this physical body will die. It's a matter of minutes before my heart stops beating and stops working because the lungs uh, and the heart are very much uh, tied together. And so it's important us, for us to note that, that God has already accounted for some of our most immediate physical needs in how he created us. Because I have these involuntary muscle uh, contractions and, 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 and actions uh, that occur every time that I inhale and, and exhale because I don't even have to think about it. Or I could use more medical terminology. When I inspire, inspiration, that's the medical term. When I inspire or I, I expire, I don't have to think about it. Even if I'm sleeping, uh, it's not something uh, that I have to think about. If, if it is something that I'm having to think about, we've got a major problem uh, on our hands. And perhaps this reflects one of our greatest, if not our greatest, spiritual need uh, as well, perhaps underscoring the need for prayer and for, for praying uh, in the Holy Ghost, because the spiritual man has needs just as well as the physical man uh, has needs, and these needs need to be viewed in much the same way. As I mentioned, if I go so long without uh, water, I will die. If I go so long without having food to eat, at some point, uh, I'm going to die. And, and uh, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6, Jesus uh, said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they, they shall be filled. If I uh, just read that verse in and of its own, I could, I could very well think to myself, well, all I, I, I need to have an interest uh, in the things of God among many other interests. But it's much more than that, and we need to view it as much more than that. That spiritual nourishment is a vital necessity for the spiritual man or my spiritual man will die. And death is a final uh, thing. And we have spiritual needs and I can draw parallels to these things. Air, uh, water, food, uh, shelter, inspiration. Uh, I mentioned prayer, praying uh, in, in the Holy Ghost. I need the Spirit of God in my life. Paul uh, said pray without ceasing. Perhaps because if I don't breathe, I will die. And I need to be sensitive uh, to God's uh, spirit. I need food. I need nourishment uh, from reading the word, uh, not once a month. Uh, I, need, I need nourishment from reading the word uh, and from prayer daily, every day. I need, I need that nourishment from the Lord. I need uh, the nourishment of water uh, from the Lord every day. I need to thirst for righteousness, thirst uh, for the things of God. I need shelter. Uh, from the enemies of the soul. I need shelter from the devil, certainly. Uh, we're called to be separate from the world and separate uh, unto God. Uh, that is some shelter uh, from the world. And, and I need uh, shelter in some respects from my own flesh. Uh, Paul said that we are to die daily. I'm to die daily. I need to keep this flesh under subjection to the spirit of Almighty God. And herein we also see a connection uh, to fasting. Somebody said amen. amen. And we have uh, some other uh, basic needs uh, as well, whether we're talking about the spiritual man those, or the physical man. These were some of the most obvious uh, uh, that came to mind. Some other needs that we have that indeed are true needs may fly under the radar a, a little bit. They're not at the forefront of my mind. Nevertheless, they are indeed uh, true needs. Some of these may be more personal uh, to you than to uh, another person. A uh, personal thing for me, as I thought about it, really uh, is laughter. I love to laugh. Uh, who was the guy that, it was Ed Wynn, I think, that sang that. Was that in Mary Poppins? Anybody remember that? I love to laugh. Ha <laughs> ha, and he's floating through the air. And I was a little kid, and man, I loved that. That just resonated with me. Because as, as far back as I can remember, I enjoyed laughing, things that made me laugh. Brother Jeff, uh, you do too. And I love seeing other people uh, uh, laugh. And there's joy uh, that comes from it. Whether, whether you think you need to laugh or not, I think we all do need uh, joy, uh, certainly. Uh, but some needs we have, we need to have friends uh, in the Lord. And it's a wonderful thing when we come uh, into the Lord, that, that some of us, uh, when you came into the Lord, maybe you came from a family and nobody else was in this. Uh, maybe some people uh, disowned you 
uh, in your own family, in a sense, uh, Sister Switzer. And, but when you come into the Lord, you find that you have friends that are closer than your own blood relatives. Indeed, you can find brothers and sisters, uh, mothers and fathers in the Lord uh, when you come into the kingdom of God. And the Lord knows uh, what it is uh, that you have need of. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Amen. He knows that you have these needs. I'm glad that he knows the, the needs that I have. Uh, I'm glad that he knew uh, about three years ago, in, in July of 2020, after so many years, that, that I still was in need of a helpmeet, somebody that was uh, suitable uh, for me. And I went out and, and uh, preached in Rockport, Indiana, and, and uh, Sister Hurricane Hannah was, was in the church that day. And I didn't look at it initially as meeting her as, oh my goodness, I'm going to the, to the store and get her a ring right now. I had a, I had a proper mindset for once, Brother Mike, that, uh, you know what, I've made an acquaintance here. And then we made plans. I was going to go out to, to, to Kentucky and, and visit her. And, uh, and uh, I just thought, well, I have an acquaintance. Great. Something proceeds from here. That's great. If it doesn't, great. I'm fine. Uh, I'm good. The Lord has been good to me, uh, but the Lord knew uh, what needs I have better than I knew. And I prayed a lot of specific things, Sister Ann. I mean specific things, because there's few things in life, few decisions in life, Sister Soraya, more important than who you marry. Amen. Critically important. And uh, one of the first things when I went to, to, to visit uh, sister, the future sister back was she had me do this. I'd been taught about love languages for, for many years, you know, and she's like, sit down. We have to do this love language quiz. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> well, this isn't going to last very long. And, uh, we take this love language quiz and lo and behold, I guess I knew it, but not really that, that one of my, my love language was touch, touch. And, and, same, same thing for her. And I thought, well, that's nice. We have a little compatibility here. And I began to, you know, we began to develop some, some friendship bonds. And I'd start going out. And I was driving, you know, a three-hour drive every single weekend. And I would tell myself, a lot of these were, you know, one, a one-day trip. I drive out in the morning. And I, I need to get home at night. And I don't want to be exhausted the next day. So I need to leave by 5.30, Hannah Marie. Okay, Brian. And it gets to about that time. And Oh, you need to leave, okay? And her hand would be kind of right here, and uh, and excuse me, brother. You know, okay, well, I'm sure glad you came, and just doing, you know, just gentle. And it paralyzed me. <laughs> and by about eight thirty or nine, I hit the road, Jack. <laughs> Amen. If there's any ladies in here, you want to know how to. Get yourself a husband. You paralyze the man you want to marry you. And he will go directly out to the ring store. You've got yourself your help me. Praise the name of the Lord. But in many other ways, God knew what I had need of. Amen. In Jesus' name. And he knows what you have need of as well. Amen. Plenty of other ways. I asked God, among specific things, I wanted a wife that truly loved God and truly loved me. And man, did I get that. If there's any way I could describe my wife, uh, her dad told me before I married her, you know, you're getting a true Christian. And uh, he was right. And I did. Thank God that he knows what our needs uh, are. We need friends in the Lord. We need, we need a help me. Perhaps not everybody uh, uh, has same needs in the same ways, but these are some needs that we have. Maybe some things that fly under the radar. We need affirmation is another thing that might fly uh, under the radar. Uh, wives need to hear, uh, my beautiful wife needs to hear me say that, that, that she, oh, she just gave me two thumbs up, that, that she is beautiful. <laughs> Husbands, your wives need to hear you say that. It's just in them that they need that. They need a, some affirmation from you. They need to know that you're grateful uh, for them, for, for the things they're doing uh, for you and for your family and, and for, your, for your love for them. Husbands, uh, need certain things. Husbands uh, need the respect. Uh, uh, they need to see and know that they are respected and, and appreciated and loved uh, uh, by their wives. Children, uh, my boy, as he gets a little older and he's uh, understanding uh, uh, words and able to converse a little more, he's going to need to hear his daddy say, hey, son, I'm proud of you. 
and he needs uh, that affirmation. We've been told many times before, and it's true, that children need to hear, uh, they need to hear mother and father say, I love you and I'm proud of you, which brings us to the next need, love. And if children uh, do not have that, many times they go on, they, they grow up in life, and there are some, some issues with them. They have problems, perhaps in dealing with individuals, uh, pr uh, problems with relationships, uh, problems with dealing with certain situations uh, that, that, that they get themselves into or that they are simply confronted with. And really, the origin of this problem oftentimes can be traced back to this simple need that was unmet for love and affirmation from parents. We all need love. That is a need that we have. We need, you need love from your spouse. You need love from your family. You need love from your brothers and your sisters in the Lord. The, the, the epistles talk at length about this. Uh, the apostle John uh, had a lot to say about this. We need love especially uh, from God. No wonder the Lord devoted so much time and so much space within his word uh, to, this, to this topic uh, of love. Uh, indeed, it was the, the greatest commandment when he was asked, what is the greatest? Tell us, what is the greatest commandment? And I, I, I like the version in Mark because it gives the most detailed response from Jesus. And he answered the question. He said, the greatest commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He got doctrine in there. True doctrine versus false doctrine. And he goes on to say, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first commandment. Uh, the second, like unto the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's none other commandment uh, greater than these. We see the importance uh, of love as it is underscored throughout the word of God. Uh, indeed, we further see in the New Testament that it is the preeminent component of the fruit of the Spirit among those components that are listed of spiritual fruit. So there are some needs that we have uh, that we are aware of. There are some needs, again, that might fly under the radar that don't come to my mind uh, right off the bat when I'm thinking about the needs or certainly the greatest of needs that I have. But what a great God that we serve, Sister Ann. What a great God we serve because whether you're aware of certain of your needs or not, God knows precisely what your greatest needs are today. He said in, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye even ask Him. And if so, then we know that God can, He's able to, and God will reveal to you what truly are your greatest needs if you are open to Him. If you are open to Him and you have a sincere heart, uh, before him, certainly, and if you ask him uh, as well. He will reveal things to you in prayer. He will reveal things to you during the preaching and ministry of the word. God will reveal things to you uh, while reading the word. God speaks to me more and reveals more things to me than when I'm reading the word than anything else. He will open your eyes to what truly are your most important needs. He will open your eyes, if you've never been born again of the water and the spirit, to Acts 2.38 salvation, to the vital necessity of repentance uh, from your sins, to water baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ, to the essentiality of the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues. God will open your eyes to sound doctrine, that there is only one God, and he will open your eyes to false doctrines out there, that you are to beware of false doctrines that are trying to preach to you or teach you that there are more, more than one uh, personage uh, in a Godhead uh, as the harlot church uh, might believe or so many out there that would, seek, that would be baptized uh, in the titles Father, Son, Holy Ghost and not in the name. When we got married, the bride, my bride took my name and God's bride is to take his name and his name is Jesus. We have to beware of false doctrine, brothers and sisters. Amen. God will open our eyes uh, to the vital necessity of holiness, without which the Bible says no man shall see the Lord. We must uh, continue in holiness of living. He'll open our eyes to the importance of spiritual authority and the need for a pastor over you. We have a pastor of this church, but I can tell you that he has spiritual authorities that he can go to and that can speak into his life, even though he is the pastor of this local assembly. And it's not easy, I might just add, sometimes for people that live in uh, certain areas, it might not be the easiest thing for them to find a good pastor that they are safe under, what he, he preaches and teaches. I can tell you, in Jesus' name, we have that here, and thank God for that.
Uh, God will open your eyes to the importance and necessity, really, of exhibiting of spiritual fruit, of love, uh, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Whether you realize it or not, you need these things. And number one in that list, and the preeminent component among those, was, again, love. Because God knows and God understands what are my greatest needs. No wonder it was the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God. In addition to the above uh, needs on an individual level, I could tell you that the church as a body has certain needs. We have a need for uh, spiritual gifts to be in operation. Now, of course, love, once again, uh, we read in the Word of God, is to be the primary motivation behind operation of spiritual gifts. But interestingly, the Apostle Paul said in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians that we are to covet earnestly the best gifts. That's talking about spiritual gifts. Uh, giftings. And when it talks about tongues uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, that's not talking about the initial infilling uh, of tongues, the sign of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's talking about the gift of tongues. Specifically, he's talking about tongues and interpretation in that chapter. Although he does elaborate a little bit about praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, even singing in the Spirit or singing with tongues in your, in your uh, private devotion uh, before the Lord. But Paul said to covet earnestly the best gifts well, what are the best gifts? Well, very simply, they are those gifts that would minister to the greatest needs in a particular time and a particular situation. Some of you have operated in, in a certain spiritual gifting. I can tell you my own experience. There's been a, a time, you know, where I've been at work or somewhere, and uh, somebody at the school, uh, an assistant, I remember, came to me one time and just, and boy, she was distraught and asked for prayer. Uh, for, for a certain need that she had with her physical health, and I prayed for her. And I could tell, I knew God wa wa was acting. I was speaking uh, certainly a, a word of wisdom, and, and I spoke a little bit of a prophetic word uh, in this situation, and there was healing that took place. She, this woman did not need uh, tongues and interpretation uh, in, the, in the clinic at this time. Uh, she did not need uh, certain things, but she had a need that, that she expressed to me and perhaps some other needs that, that, that she did not express to me, whether she knew them or not. And when I spoke and prayed with her, God knew and God ministered uh, uh, to those needs. God knows the greatest needs uh, that we have. Amen. And in our story of this man uh, with a palsy, uh, we see there were a lot of needs present. Many times... When somebody preaches on this topic, they will focus largely on the scribes and what Jesus had to say to them, that, that, that he was proving the authority to them the authority that he had to forgive sins by what he did in healing this man. Many times people will focus upon his friends and, and the faith that they had and the great faith that they had uh, with, with the length that they went to to bring this man before uh, the Messiah. But there were, the truth is, within this house, this house was packed inside and out like sardines uh, in, in a can. There's a reason they could not just get this man uh, before Jesus, and they had to go to such lengths to get him there. But I want you to know, there were as many needs in that house as there were people present, and more so. And Jesus knew every single one of them. There were the scribes, there were the men who carried this man, with a palsy, there were other witnesses within this house. There were the disciples of Jesus. You think Jesus didn't minister to the needs of his disciples when he was with them privately? He did. There weren't just pressing needs for them right there. But nevertheless, they had a need to witness uh, and observe these events that were going on to, and to learn for themselves. And it no doubt would help them in their future uh, uh, ministries. Praise the name of the Lord. And the friends... This man's friends that, that, that brought him, they may have thought that they knew what was his greatest need. Certainly it was a great need, but was it his greatest need? To see this man healed, no doubt, uh, would seem to have been the utmost desire in the hearts and minds of his friends. But imagine, after all the effort that they put forth to bring him to Jesus, imagine what their reaction was to the first words that Jesus spoke to this man. Son, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven thee. Hmm? Were they stunned? Were they surprised? Were they disappointed? Did they feel let down a little bit? It, was it not exactly what they 
uh, wanted to hear? Or is it possible even that they were rejoicing uh, inside because they knew that the Lord was indeed beginning a certain work on this man? Did the initial words of Jesus test their faith in his healing power, you could even ask? And what about the man himself? He was paralyzed for some length of time. Was he surprised? Was he caught off guard? Was he disappointed? Uh, did these initial words of Jesus take the wind out of his sails? When Jesus said, be of good cheer, your sins be forgiven thee, did he go? <sighs> whoop doo you know? I don't think so. Excuse me. Need a little hand sanitizer. Was this man hoping, was he let down at all because he was hoping that Jesus would heal him right then and there? It might have seemed like the perfect timing, Brother Poole, to him. I want to suggest to you today that the reaction of this man to the initial words that Jesus spoke to him, however, was none of the above. And I'm going to step out on a limb a little bit and read between the lines if I veer off and I'm incorrect in something. A uh, pastor will have his antenna go up and he'll have a word to say about that, but, but I, I endeavored to rightly divide the word of truth here, and I, th I think I've done so. Jesus was fully aware, not only of the greatest needs of the man with palsy, but of every individual within that room. And for every individual in that room, there was a purpose behind the order in which the things were spoken to this man. Scripture tells us that the, what the purpose was as far as the scribes were concerned, Jesus said that ye may know that I have power to forgive sins. He said to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But as for the man with the palsy, what Jesus did was simply this. He dealt with his greatest need first. Amen. That being to deal with this problem of sin uh, in his life. And this is a problem uh, that we all have because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you see, sin brings separation from God. Uh, sin brings uh, disfellowship uh, from God. And so these initial words also seem to shed some light upon this man and what was going through his mind and what he had been experience, experiencing some time prior. Because God doesn't just go around and forgive everybody's sins that do not repent. His mercy is available. The Bible says, His mercy endureth forever. There's an entire psalm. That's in every single verse of that psalm. For His mercy endureth forever. I remember Brother Labatt uh, preaching on that years ago, and he had the congregation. Every time, every verse he read, say with him, For His mercy endureth forever. And a point got across there to us. But Jesus said in Luke 13, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And this would seem to imply that forgiveness of sins does not occur in the absence of of true uh, repentance. And so I want to say a few words about uh, true repentance. Uh, this is a major theme uh, throughout the Bible. We were just reading through, uh, starting to read Revelation just last night at home. And uh, uh, boy, he was, uh, John was calling out every one of the churches in the first three chapters to repent. He was calling them to turn from some ways that they had turned to, turn back to God and align themselves back with their first love, with Almighty God, who they had come to, who had called them out of sin, out of darkness and into His uh, marvelous light. Peter and Paul uh, and James and their epistles called uh, people unto repentance. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, everywhere He went, was calling people unto repentance. He was calling them to come out of sin. He was calling sin for what it was. He was not sweeping sin under the rug and just saying, you can do what you want. It's covered because I'm, I'm going to go and, and die on the cross uh, pretty soon. So live however you want. No, no, no. Jesus was calling people out of sin. His apostles in the first church were calling people out of sin. Uh, his apostles who writ the books wrote the books of the New Testament were calling people uh, to repentance. His prophets in the Old Testament uh, one after another, we're calling people uh, unto a place of repentance. Moses, uh, Abraham, Noah were being called to repentance from the Lord, and they were calling others to repentance. God even desired Adam at the fall of man. He was desiring him to come to him and confess his, his sins to him, to repent uh, from what he had done. True repentance, we see, is much more than... Sorrow, just simply sorrow and regret. That's a part of it. 
Godly sorrow worketh repentance. We're told in 2 Corinthians 7, a broken and a contrite heart God will not despise in Psalm 51. But there are lots of people out there who feel sorrow and regret for their actions, or at least the consequences of those actions, and yet they will not turn from sin. They will to continue uh, to live in sin. But true repentance involves several things. Along with sorrow and contrition, it involves a recognition uh, of your sinful state. Jesus said that, I I came not to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. But we know that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And therefore, we know that God, to begin with, will save only that recognize uh, their sinful state. But repentance also involves confession to the Lord of that sinful state, as well as, and this is critically important, turning away from your your old sinful lifestyle. Uh, There's been a whole lot of hubbub going on in the United Kingdom uh, uh, this weekend, and if you ever, if you saw any videos of the guards walking, walking uh, out in front of the palace or any of these buildings there in front, they'll, they'll, they'll walk so far, and when they, they don't go about face, like we say in America, they're And I don't do it exactly right. Pastor, can you demonstrate proper, start marching this way. No, 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 just start marching. And then stop. And I'm not going to say about face. This is what they say. Repent. And that's how it's done. I would have been, I wouldn't have sold you. I would have been, repent. You know, and, and kind of all gangly like the scarecrow. That's what repentance is. It's so much more. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for me to uh, turn from the way that I used to live, to turn from the former man, to turn from the things that I used to say and the, the things that I used to do, and to turn not just away from that, but towards him, and to go in the direction that's towards him, seeking to align myself with him, with his will, with his plan, his purpose, with his word. That's what uh, uh, repentance uh, is. But, but when we do repent, God takes notice of it when we change the way that, that, that we live. Proverbs chapter 28, uh, Sister Ruth, just, just further underscoring uh, that point. He that covereth his sins, chapter 28 and verse 13, shall not prosper. But the Bible says, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them, his sins, shall have mercy. Paul preached this uh, likewise in Acts chapter 26, that men uh, should repent and turn to God and do works meet for uh, repentance. This involves action. This involves a change in the way that I live. This means that repentance uh, involves this change, which is a turning away from sin and a turning toward God. And the thing is this. Uh, I can be fooled. Pastor can be fooled. Brother Mike can be fooled. Any man can be fooled. God cannot be fooled. You're not going to fool the Lord. If you're asking forgiveness from the Lord, words are coming from your mouth and they're just empty words and true repentance is not in your heart, God knows it immediately. And don't think that you're, you're going to fool him. This, and this is very important. But when true repentance does indeed occur, God takes notice every time. And angels take notice. They rejoice over one sinner that repents. Uh, the Bible says, because when you truly repent, it demonstrates to God that you're taking the first step that you need to take toward restoring fellowship with God. Because it was sin uh, that separated man from God. It's sin that erected this barrier uh, between God and man preventing fellowship. And God desires fellowship with his creation. And when you repent, you're taking an initial step toward tearing down this barrier and restoring uh, this fellowship. And we see Jesus in Matthew 9 said to this man with a palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. This would seem to imply to me that true repentance had indeed already taken place with this man, that some restoration of fellowship was there. He said, be of good cheer. I I, I think no doubt sorrow and contrition uh, was, was no doubt in this man's heart. Uh, as well, and and it seems to me that not only had this man confessed, but that he had forsaken old sinful ways uh, of the past, and he had forsaken those sins with a sincere heart. Now, this was still under the old covenant. This was still Old Testament. Uh, This was sufficient 
for forgiveness. We see under the New Covenant, the New Testament, which does not begin uh, until after the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost comes, and, and, and boy, those, those men, they had some contrition and sorrow when they were pricked in their heart, and they said, men and brother, what, well, what shall we do? And P, then Peter said to them, repent, the first part of it, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And as far as theologically speaking, that word remission is the same as forgiveness. Under the new covenant, forgiveness comes by a combination of repentance as well as baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. This man was still under the old covenant. Uh, repentance was indeed sufficient uh, in his case. Uh, but evidently he had repented of his sins because Jesus granted him forgiveness. Now there was one commentary that I read, uh, interestingly, that, that said, well, uh, and they were postulating reasons for what, why Jesus said what he did. And, and as one possibility, they, they said that there were many people in that day that believed that, that, that sickness was necessarily the result of an individual's sin uh, or their parents. And, and so this man, therefore, may have felt extra guilt or shame to be in front of Jesus because of this, uh, this, this physical condition, this palsy that he had was, was due to sin, either of his own uh, or his parents. I reject this argument. Uh, this is not correct. Jesus uh, even uh, talked on this same matter in John chapter 9 regarding a man that was blind from birth. And, and his disciples asked him, did this man sin or, or his parents? And Jesus said, no, that's, that's not the reason at all uh, for, for this man's blindness. Now, there can be a link. There can indeed be a link between sin and, and sinful living and physical ailments uh, and conditions. Uh, that does not seem, I don't see any evidence of that being uh, the case here. Uh, because sickness, uh, and sickness is not necessarily the result of an individual's sin, except Adam and Eve. There was no sickness until the fall of man. Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. But in this case, in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus granted this man forgiveness of sins, he simply addressed this man's greatest need and most prioritized need, or what should have been his most prioritized need, first. Was the man with the palsy surprised by the initial words Jesus spoke to him? Maybe, maybe not. Was he disappointed or let down? I say he was not. I think he may have been quite satisfied if Jesus had not said another word unto him. No doubt his, his, his palsy uh, was a pressing need for him, but I want to submit to you today, brothers and sisters, the most prioritized need in the mind of this man with the palsy may indeed have been aligned uh, with that need that had the most eternal consequences. Above anything else, I suggest he may have been uh, longing to hear those words of forgiveness from the Messiah. And that even if he had not been healed, he may well have gone home happy. And as I read this and God was impressing this on my mind, I was thinking about the three Hebrew children in, in Daniel chapter 3. And I didn't give you this scripture, Sister, Sister Ruth. But, but the, the three Hebrew children, they were confronted with the prospect of being tossed into this fiery furnace. And we see that they were going to obey the Lord... Uh, no matter what. They said in, uh, in uh, chapter 3, verse 17, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Speaking bold words to the king. And they went, on, they went on to say in verse 18, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Listen here, king. We face... Some di a dire situation here, a pressing need. Is even this our greatest need? Looking, staring right into a fiery furnace? Maybe so, maybe not. It would seem to me they were, that it was, but, but they were going to obey God's word whether God delivered them from the fiery furnace or he didn't. And I just wonder, as I think about this man with the palsy, if likewise he had aligned himself in repentance with the Lord so well that God not only addressed the most pressing need that he knew was his most pressing need, but that this man uh, knew as well that was aligned as the most important need with God's word and with his will. Because along with acknowledging and confessing our sins, 
along with feeling sorrow and contrition and seeking forgiveness, when we truly repent, uh, we will desire for our will to align with his will. And it just may have been that the first words, the initial words that Jesus spoke to this man addressed not only what Jesus recognized as his greatest need, but what he himself recognized as such. Shall we stand? Praise the Lord. I threw out a song suggestion, Andrea, but you may have thought of something better. Jesus performed two notable acts regarding this man, as, as the scripture records here. Uh, one of these acts was healing. One was forgiveness of sins. One of these acts was a greater, was in regarding a greater need, one was regarding a lesser need, if you really think about what is, is most important. One act, the healing, had temporary consequences. Even if this man got healed, same with anybody that Jesus healed, time passed, and eventually they died. The other act, forgiveness of sins, had eternal consequences, assuming that this man would continue uh, living for the Lord. One act had visible results immediately, healing. The other act, forgiveness of sins, uh, was not something perceptible by the five senses. And we see in this story and in each account of it that Jesus performed the lesser act that he might prove the greater. He performed the temporary that he might prove the eternal. He performed the visible that they might believe the invisible. Amen. The invisible, that he indeed had power and authority to forgive sins because he truly was God manifest in the flesh. And he still has that power and authority today, brothers and sisters. As for the man who was a recipient of these acts, he had a lot to be thankful for and to rejoice over, especially because he knew that God knew precisely what he needed most. In Jesus' name. And he knows what you need most in your life today. He knows what I need most uh, in my life today. Praise singers, would you come on up here, please? I want to say if there's anybody in the house this morning, and, and I think that was me, brother. If you ha have a need that's just pressing upon your mind, maybe it's your greatest need this morning, maybe it's not. But it's certainly the, the elephant in the room in your mind. Uh, so to speak. And if you'd like prayer for that need, I'd like to pray for you for that need. And some of our ministry will pray for you as well. I want to open the altar at this time, but I would say that as you come forward, have that in your mind that, that, that Lord, I simply want to be aligned with your will and with what you see as the most important thing for me. And you might just ask God, Lord, do what is best for me because you know what it is. We'll pray for you for that need, but let's have, have that mindset and that, that attitude in your heart. I, Lord, I just want to be aligned with your will. This is my pressing need. I lay it before you. Whether you heal me if I'm in need of healing, whether you give me deliverance, whether you give me financial blessing right now or not, I'm going to continue to serve you. I'm going to continue uh, to be faithful unto you. The altar is open at this time. Go ahead and start singing, please.